Hello, Jan Genies. Before we get started, Rich and I want to let you in on some even more exciting updates for our Patreon subscribers. As you know, Patreon is a site where listeners can pledge a small monthly amount, either five or ten dollars, to support the cost of bringing you your favorite podcast. All patrons get early access to new Cutoff Jeans episodes before they're released to the public. But the most exciting new perk is that all of our patrons will be able to listen to an exclusive bonus episode of the podcast every other week. Topics include personal stories that I'm not ready to share publicly, conversations with family and friends. And sometimes we'll devote an entire episode to other subjects we love, like musical theater or classic television. Rich and I enjoy bringing you the Cutoff Jeans podcast, and it would mean so much if you would consider supporting our labor of love. Just go to patreon.com slash cutoff jeans podcast. Thank you so much, my Jen Genies. And now, on with the show. Is your family tree a mystery? Are you fascinated by genealogy? Well, hip hip hooray, let's talk DNA with Julie. The truth is in your genes. In cutoff jeans. <laughs> Welcome to Cut Off Jeans, the podcast that helps you find your truth using nothing but DNA. I'm Julie Dixon-Jackson. I'm a genetic genealogist, henceforth known as a Gen Genie. And I am Richard Castle, the co-host and producer of this podcast. How's it going, Julie? It's going. It's going well, huh? It's it's going. I did not say well. Oh, it's just going. But it is going. I'm telling you, I am so happy that we have fall weather. I mean, we had a really hot, hot October up until now in Los Angeles. And now it is just, this is, I go, this is why I'm here, like this weather. Yeah. So we had a relatively cool September. Yeah. Um, I don't know about August because I wasn't here, but... It was hot um, as hell. <laughs> exactly. And so September was kind of cool. Then October got hot again. Yeah. But usually we're still going to have heat waves into November. I'm going to enjoy it while I can. So anyway, what's going on with DNA news? You know what? I, I didn't even tell you I was going to talk about this, but I thought it was interesting. And oh. maybe we can look at yours too. Tell me whether or not I've actually brought this up. Because <laughs> okay. now I'm now that I'm saying that I may have um, ancestry has a new feature that breaks down traits that you may have based on your DNA and from which parent you inherited it. I, yes, I don't know that we talked about it, but I remember getting an email from them and clicking on oh. it, and then they wanted me to pay to sign up, and I'm like, I'll just, right, I'll just ask Julie. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> exactly. They exactly. also have a new thing. Like I just got it. I think I just got the email this morning where they have, they're doing pet DNA now. Yes, they are. Way to jump the shark <laughs> ancestry. I already had my dog's <laughs> DNA done. You know, I think I had his done before I did my own. Yeah, I think you did too. Yeah. Um, so, oh, they also did a, a recently um, updated their, their ethnicity breakdown as well. I don't know if you knew that. I'm not 50-50 anymore. You are still 50-50. Yours did not change one iota. Oh, my God. I am like Not such, at all. I'm such a purebred. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, purebred, like not really purebred, but actually. Pure half and half. Pure uh, half and half. Purebred, yeah. yes. So mine changed a little, and it actually makes less sense to me than the last one did. Oh, well. The last one was almost perfect. But this time, my Sweden and Denmark is higher than my Norway, which doesn't really make sense because I can pinpoint where my Norway comes from. Hmm. Um, And my Norway is only 2% now, and my Sweden and Denmark is 3%. I mean, Sweden and Denmark and Norway are actually interchangeable. Yeah, and you also said, I remember we talked about this, is that it's all an estimate. You know, yes. like it's, and but it is supposed to get more pinpointed the more people that test. Yes. But, you know, mine did change a little bit. Um, and my whales actually went up to 9%. Were they killer whales? <laughs> <laughs> that reminds me of that joke. Remember the, are you two whales? Uh, where, no, what is it? I don't know. Oh. Are you two ladies? We have told the story here before. I love it so okay. much. The guy walks into a bar. There were two women at the bar and they were talking and they had accents. And he said, are you two ladies from Scotland? And they said, Wales. And he said, oh, I'm sorry. Are you two whales from Scotland? <laughs> I don't remember that. 
That makes but, me laugh. But I like it. It's sort yeah. of like the time um, I was playing the song. That, uh, I was at work and I was um, yeah. in a restaurant and I'm sitting at the piano and I'm playing a song that I, you know, not many people know, but someone mm-hmm. sitting behind me taps me on the shoulder while I'm playing and said, but beautiful. And I said, oh, well, thank you for noticing. <laughs> But beautiful. Um, okay, wait, I, I, I'm I going back on this. Sweden and Denmark, yes, is a little higher than Norway, but Sweden and Denmark are on my paternal side, and I have no idea where that came from. So, Well, what about the traits then? What's How is... Okay, let's go back to the traits. I want to go to the uh, Ancestry and sign in and have them say, here's a trait that we found, you know, in your DNA, and it just says snarky. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like 100%. Spot on. (laughs) Um, (laughs) Okay, so remember, again, this is not scientific. This is just likelihood based on other testers, okay? Right. And the ones that, that, uh, to me, are the most significant, well, the one that is really the most significant. So it tells you what you are likely or not likely to have and then which side it's influenced from. I see. And the one that sticks out to me is dancing, least likely to enjoy dancing. <laughs> and it's influenced from both sides. It's weird that that would be a, um, a, a trait in your DNA. I mean, I know. Is it saying something about like, it, does it think because neither of my parents have rhythm? I don't know. What is it? What does it mean? <laughs> But also it says I'm unlikely to have freckles and I've always had freckles, especially as a child. So I I understand like why the DNA might say, oh, you know, you're more likely to have freckles, but I don't understand dancing. (laughs) I don't either. It's really weird. It's really weird. Unless it's a athletic thing. I don't know. I'd even understand snarky before I'd understand dancing. I wish That's Snarky was in here. Oh. I can't tell you how much I wish, wish Snarky was in here. <laughs> it would really have just made my day. Uh, while we're here, you are still exactly 50% Jewish and uh, 43% Irish with 4% Scotland and 3% uh, England, oh, Northwestern. Okay, Europe. well, I think that might have changed because I was 50% like Irish and 50% Jewish. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> at one okay. Time. Well, so then that did get a little so more. So the Jewish specific. part has stayed exactly the same, yes, but Ed will never change. <laughs> you're telling by me the way. it's like a, <laughs> it's like my grandmother's curse. <laughs> <laughs> oh Lord, the curse of the Jews. All right, I'm going to now go. So um, I want to talk about adult adoptee issues a little bit. Okay, and. Um, friend of the show, Lorraine Gerald, who is also known as the Adopted Chameleon, has a Facebook group called The Chameleon. And recently, several of the adoptee Facebook groups just posted a question saying, as an adoptee, what would you like people to know? Hmm. And then fill in the blank. And so many, as, as much as the amount of times people tell me, oh, I've never heard it. I know lots of adoptees. None of them have ever said anything like that or feel that way. Well, you should see the ones that do feel that way and how many there are. Yeah, I mean, honestly, I don't, we'll talk I don't know that I would know anywhere near as much. And I don't know. No, I know I wouldn't know anywhere near as much yeah. about adoptee issues if we were not doing this podcast together. And I've known you for years. Yes. You know, but it's just, right. again, well, it, and I never talked about it before I was out of the fog either. So sure. But I know other adoptees, too. But we, it's not something we discuss at length. Let's put it that way. Right. It's more like a fact yeah. of like, oh, this is my family. Oh, this is I'm adopted. Um, you know, this is my family. And I'm, you know, I, yes. I don't pry. But into even it. as I as I said, they may be feeling that way. But don't I mean, even if you don't even sure, even, even if you do talk about it and they do feel similarly to me, they may not say it because of the grief that we get yes. for saying it. Yes. You know what I'm saying? And, and all, um, honestly, when I do mention if somebody were to tell me that they were adopted or a birth mother or something like that, like that and then mm-hmm. I mention this podcast, if they didn't know about it, then yep. they're more free to talk to me about it. Like then they open up about it. Yep. Yep. It's kind of a like a, because it's not a popular opinion for the general public, yeah. even though it's not an opinion. It's a lived experience. After they get out over the initial shock of what you do a podcast about ge- genetic genealogy and you're the <laughs> right. musician, musical the theater. piano man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 
It is kind of weird. Huh? Um, all right. I'm not going to say the names of the people that gave these answers because it's from a private group. Um, and I don't have permission to identify them. Sure. But I am going to give their answers, um, not in a plagiaristic sort of way, but because I think that it's their good answers and I can write to every single one. Of Great. Them. Okay, so this first one says that I can love my adoptive parents dearly, but still long for a relationship with my first family. I can love all of my family. It isn't either or. I would also like them to know that even with the best possible conditions, a child removed from their family, however young, is going to have trauma related to the separation. Hmm. That's nice and succinct. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Here's one. Please don't call me special because I was chosen. Yeah, hmm. that's a that's a red flag right there. And we hear it a lot. Well, you can call me special no matter what. <laughs> yeah, not because I was chosen. Not, uh, <laughs> just because I'm special. <laughs> because I'm special. Um, this person says that we will always be plan B in a parent's journey to become parents. Adoption is never a first choice. Hmm. Or almost never, I guess. Um, adoption is not unconditional love. There are conditions on each adoptee with common themes, like being forced to be a secret, expecting to forget family, allegiance to others' perception of love, and the list goes on and on. Yep. Um, that being adopted can lead to complex post-traumatic stress disorder. The way adoptees sometimes react is a result of being relinquished at birth, the trauma experienced, and the primal wound. Certain situations and experiences can arouse and trigger those feelings of abandonment, worthlessness, and rejection. And for those who are not adopted, may find this difficult to understand. Somebody just said, please don't ask me a question about my real mother. Please see my pain. The idea of real mother is also, I um, it, it's it kind of an ignorant thing to say, and I, I'm not saying ignorant in terms of somebody saying it um, intentionally ignorant, but just to say that and not be birth mother or something like that, as opposed to real yeah, mother. Yeah, I mean, re- real, uh, yes, real implies that, real or fake. Right, exactly. That, yeah. As if your adopted mother is not your mother, yes. <laughs> your real mother. You know what I mean? Like, right. It doesn't, it, it, it's kind of, it's insulting, but without, I doubt anybody says it meaning to be insulting oh sure yeah at least as adults kids said it to me all the time as a kid's meaning to be insulting (laughs) (laughs) kids are fun (laughs) that even if you are lucky enough to meet your bio family you know you don't have the shared memories of growing up together that family means so that is that's an interesting concept that a lot of people like they think that oh you found your biological family now you have all your answers however you still have Nothing is complete. You grew up with this family who you have memories with, but there is a disconnect right. because you are not connected to them and in some ways a huge disconnect. And then you find this biological family, but you don't have shared memories. And so you don't, you, you don't feel, really feel a part of either family. Right, right. You know what I mean? I see that. And it, what's, it's interesting to hear that as someone who was not adopted, because I have um, a brother I grew up with, and we should mm-hmm. have shared memories. But I feel like even though we were raised in the same house, we have very different opinions or memories of what happened. And it's so... Isn't int- that interesting? It's fascinating. Like, yes. I, I'm like, weren't we both there? But at the same time, but we have... It's perception. Com- yeah, it, that is just perception. Mm-hmm. Um, yes. That is not, I'm not saying uh, that is the same as someone who was just not there and therefore does right. not have the memory. But it kind of fascinates me that even if you were there, your memories are completely different. <laughs> um, I dare say one of you is wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and there, I'm just you know, spitballing somewhere here. Somewhere <laughs> in between is probably the truth. Yes, 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 yes. yes. All right, here we go. I'll do one last one. That being adopted means you illegally belong to the parents who adopted you. That the bio family has zero rights unless the adoptee chooses. They gave up those rights, even the grandparents. That the adoptee does have a right to know their bio family when they are ready. I have great parents. They are the ones who fed me, clothed me, and sheltered me. They are the ones who stayed up with me when I was sick. I had a great life. I was adopted at six months. Okay. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, Those are all, I mean, uh, I think, I feel like I've heard a variation of all of those. You absolutely have. From you and from all the people we've interviewed on the, on the podcast. Right. Yeah. And it's just, I like these, there are so many 
on all of these questions on each of the pages that it was asked, there are hundreds and hundreds of responses, which like on this one, there's 77. Right. But this is just one of them. And, and I would um, imagine it would be comforting to find that community if you did, if you didn't have one and find, yes. oh my goodness, other people feel it's the same way as I do. so comforting. It makes you feel crazy sometimes. Yeah. When you when you feel this way, and I'm like, am I really the only one that felt this way? Right. It wasn't until you know much later that like even my friends that were adopted uh, as well uh, when I was a kid, and at the time I remember feeling envious of this one girl that I went to school with because she looked like her family, she acted like her family, she was so much like them, and I was like, wow, that was a really good match, <laughs> um, but. She constantly, she still does not talk openly about it, but she likes every time I comment or, or I make, or I post something about it. She uh, is the first to say, yep. Wow. You know what I mean? Because yeah. there are a lot of people don't want to talk about it. And you never know what goes on behind closed doors. It's like when you see a couple and you're like, oh, they seem so happy. And then you find out they're divorcing. Sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You just Absolutely. don't know. You just don't know. Mm-hmm. But uh, that's really interesting. Should we take a break? Let's. If you're enjoying our podcast, please subscribe, rate, and review. Or consider supporting us on our Patreon page, patreon.com forward slash cutoff jeans podcast. Now back to Julie and me. We are back and we are going to talk about King Tut. <laughs> what a nut. <laughs> funky, funky tut. Okay. Uh, I actually read this article quite a long time ago, and just whenever I would think I was going to talk about it, something else would come up that would replace it. But it's it's uh, it's evergreen. It'll it'll be an interesting story forever. So I found this article about the real face of King Tut. Okay. So he had the headline is Pharaoh had girlish hips, a club foot, and buck teeth, according to virtual autopsy that also revealed his parents were brother and sister. None of this is that shocking to me. And yes. like, especially in royalty, when it, you're talking yes. about royalty. Right. And especially that long ago in royalty. Right. I mean, yeah. you know, nothing was, uh, I mean, everything was on the table, apparently. <laughs> um, with strong features cast in burnished gold, Tutankhamun's burial mask projects an image of majestic beauty and royal power. But in the flesh, King Tut had buck teeth, a club foot, and girlish hips, according to the most detailed examination ever of the ancient Egyptian pharaoh's remains. And rather than being a boy king with a love of chariot racing, Tut relied on walking sticks to get around his during his rule in the 14th century before Christ or BC, research has said. Wow. But in the flesh, King Tut had buck teeth. A club, why, why are we doing this? Why are we repeating it? I don't know. <laughs> Maybe you just like saying girlish hips. <laughs> girlish hips is fine. If you have a girlish hips and a what club is a foot. Yeah, that can't know, be like good. The, what does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> like a girl who's walking on one high heel? That Pretty much, yeah. Like a drunk woman... Leaving TGI Fridays on Saturday. (laughs) Okay, so on November 4th, 1922, uh, a group found steps that led to Tutankhamun's tomb and spent several months cataloging the antechamber. They opened the burial chamber and discovered that the sarcophagus... uh, discovered the sarcophagus in February the following year. The revelations are made in one BBC, in BBC One documentary, Tutankhamun, The Truth Uncovered. Albert Zink from the Institute for Mummies and the Iceman in Italy, I want to go to the Institute for the Mummies and the Iceman, uh, deciphered the truth about the ruler's parents by studying the royal family's DNA. He found that Tut was born after his father... Akhenpaha, dubbed the heretic king, had a relationship with his sister. Incest was not frowned upon by the ancient Egyptians, and they did not know about the health implications for any offspring. Hutan Ashrafian, uh, a lecturer in surgery at Imperial College London, said that several members of the family appeared to have suffered from ailments which can explain, be explained by hormonal imbalances. He said a lot of his family predecessors lived to a ripe old age. Only his immediate line were dying early and they were dying earlier each generation. 
Egypt- and didn't he? Didn't King Tut die very young? Yes, he, he was a teenager. He, yeah. 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 Egyptian radiologist Ashraf Salim said the virtual autopsy shows the toes are divergent in layman's terms. It's a club foot. He would have been heavily limping. There is only one site where we can say a fracture happened before he died, and that is the knee. Evidence of King Tut's physical limitations are also backed up by 130 used walking canes found in his tomb. Wow. Wow. I guess they didn't want to repurpose any of those for other people who had trouble walking. Yes, because they were King Tut's. Or yeah. I, I did watch this, and I have to, if I recall, they pronounced it Tutankhamun. Mm, okay. You know, I just wanted to try that. All right. Presenter Dallas Campbell said, try to navigate through the intense speculation and politics that surrounded one of the most famous characters in history is both daunting and thrilling in equal measure. Foolhardy, perhaps, but using solid science and a truly multidisciplinary approach, we've finally been able to put to bed some of the myths and preconceived ideas that have surrounded his life and death and hopefully add a new chapter that will ensure that Tutankhamun story continues to fascinate. Earlier this year, Egyptologists from the American University in Cairo shed light on some of the bizarre burial rituals discovered in the tomb, including the fact that the king's penis was embalmed at a 90-degree angle. Oh, dear. I forgot that was there. (laughs) That's a new wrinkle. (laughs) (laughs) Or not. (laughs) I mean, I guess in case he met like a hot queen in the afterlife. That uh, they wanted to present him as ever masculine, I suppose. Mm. Um, Oh, it says the only mummy to have ever been found with this feature. Fascinating. They claimed that this may have been carried out on purpose to make the king appear like Osiris, the god of the underworld, in an attempt to frighten religious revolutionaries. Well, that would scare me. Uh, At the (laughs) time of his death in 1323 BC, the father of the teenage Egyptian king was said to be leading a religious revolution in the country. It is believed... Akhenaten wanted to destroy the belief in the Egyptian gods and instead worship a sun disk called Aten. Tutankhamun was trying to tackle this revolution when he was believed to have broken his leg and died from an infection in the wound. DNA analysis in 2010 also found traces of malaria in his system. During the mummification, a decision was made to not only embalm the erect penis... (laughs) but also to cover the king's body in black liquid, similar in color to the skin of Osiris. Well, King Tut is the only Egyptian king with an OnlyFans account. (laughs) There's something to that. Uh, These rituals, (laughs) according to the Professor Salima Ikram from the university, were done in order to to, to make people think Tutankhamun was the underworld god. Hmm. So, yeah. So there's also, it seems to be missing here. So it there's some legend about him getting that um, injury, that broken leg in a chariot race. But according to these researchers and these analysts, there's no way somebody it, with his physical condition uh, had the prowess to be able to drive a chariot. Yeah, his prowess, uh, you know, was <laughs> elsewhere. I don't think he had anything to do with that prowess personally. Well, here's the thing I want to know is what, um, in what condition could that DNA have been in when they found, I mean, he was thousands of years old Mm -hmm. when they, when they found the tomb. But, and so, but very well embalmed. So probably pretty good condition. Wow, yeah. that's fascinating. Yeah, they, really there's is. a mask, or they actually did an entire uh, reconstruction of what he looked like, and it's not pretty. I, I'm sorry. I well, mean, you I mean, know. On a, it's, it's like when you have a portrait done, um, they make you look a little better <laughs> because they want to. So a I little, feel like when they, get, yeah. when they did the death, death mask or whatever, they're like, well, this is for eternity. Let's make him look a little better than he did. Let's fix his teeth. Absolutely. You know, you know. Yeah. why wouldn't you? Add a little extra embalming liquid in that 90 degree penis. <laughs> I don't think I'm going to sleep well tonight. <laughs> Just, I, this is a new thing. I've never heard of this before. You know, I had forgotten about that because it's been so long since I've been sitting on this article <laughs> that it took me by surprise. All right. I think we both need a break after that. <laughs> All right. Let's do that. All righty. Thank you for listening to Cut Off Jeans with Julie Dixon Jackson and Richard Castle. You can support us by going to patreon.com forward slash cutoffjeanspodcast. Now, back to the program. 
All right, we're back, and I am still telling the story of walking in the footsteps of my ancestors. You guys, I promise as soon as I'm done with this, there's only a couple more, (laughs) I will start having uh, interviews with other adoptees and other people with great stories. Well, I'm Um, enjoying it. I mean, thank you. it it was a big, massive trip. I mean, it was like a... It was massive. Well, I mean, it was a month. You were gone, what, a month? Yep. That's a long time to... I was. For an American, it is. I know in Europe, they travel. They do it all the time. Yes, but for us, you know, I don't remember the last time I went away for a week, let alone a month. Yeah, I haven't gone away for a month in years, years and years. Even like when I go to Australia, I only go for three weeks. Right, right. Yeah, so, yeah. Well, so continue uh, on this uh, walking in the footsteps. Okay, so when last we spoke, we had been in Wallasey, Cheshire, looking at the properties of the Chadwick family, um, our third great-grandparents who had these properties, and we found the property lines, and we found the walls that used to uh, be in the front of those properties are still there. Yes. Which was super-duper cool. So uh, next we decided we wanted to go to Chester, which is one of the main cities in Cheshire. Uh, It's another ancient city. And I went specifically because there was a church that I wanted to see that that was for another line in our family. So uh, we drove, it was about an hour, I guess, to Chester from Wallasey. And uh, I got to be real, the hotel was a little bit dodgy at this one. (laughs) Also, this was uh, one of the places where in the restaurant, this happened a lot. I forgot to mention this, but like the mater d would be like, we'd go down for breakfast and you go, ooh, I'll put you over in the corner in this much more romantic place. <laughs> and we're like, we're brother and sister. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it was very yeah. sweet of them to do. But yes. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, we're both like, oh, that's But I get weird. it though. Like how many brothers and sisters, adults travel, travel, travel together, together, you know, that is true. That yeah. is true. I'm like, can't you tell we're, we're identical. <laughs> no, really. Okay. So we, we checked in and then we only had one night in Chester. Uh, I actually would like to have stayed a couple, um, but we were running out of time, but in hindsight, now when I look, when I go back and research what I missed, I'm like, oh, I wish I could have seen that, but Hey, that's for All the, the more next reason trip. to go back. Exactly. So um, the old Chester city, the within town, I guess, within the walls of the ancient city walls. All of these old cities have walls around them still, or parts of the walls, because they were walled. All of them were walled years ago. Um, was uh, let me see. The first thing we saw was Chester Cathedral, which was originally built in 1092 by the Catholic Church. And somewhere along the way, it was turned into a Protestant church and is actually now the largest Protestant church in Britain. So we had lunch at the town hall and then we wandered through Old Chester. Um, Old Chester, the the Chester is, has much like York, but it has even more of the Tudor style buildings Mm -hmm. and it just feels so charming. And um, the weather was weird. It was cold. And so I was like, I shocking. It's cold, cold in England, whole, <laughs> but it was summer. <laughs> but this, this explains, this is how the weather is in England in general. So finally I was like, I'm not going to be comfortable until I have something to wear over what I'm wearing. So I went into this uh, store called fat face, which is <laughs> a chain store there. <laughs> I don't know why it's called fat face. It makes me laugh. Um, <laughs> And I, and I bought um, a cardigan, and it immediately got too hot as soon as I put it on. <laughs> uh, so we found our, we walked through when we were outside the uh, old city gate because um, we were heading for St. John the Baptist. Now, St. John the Baptist is where our fourth great-grandparents, John Bolton and Anne Meredith, were married in 1787, and buried, well, at least John, was buried in 1807. Um and possibly remarried and died as late as 1842, but I don't have anything to prove any of that. Um, and also remember, I'm talking about my fourth great grandparents. Remember, we have 64 fourth great grandparents. Yes. So, yeah. Um, all of their children were baptized there, including our third great grandmother, Anne Bolton, who married John Taylor. Um, their son, also, John was married to Jane Chadwick. So the Anne Bolton and John Taylor's son 
was married to Jane Chadwick of the Chadwicks of Wallasey, whose properties we had just been at. Okay. That's wow. how that all ties in. So I didn't know what to expect of St. John's because I every time I Googled it, it it looked like some ruins, like really pretty pictures of ruins, but just ruins. And yes. So I thought it was nothing but ruins. But when we walked up to it, it was from the front, just walking up to it, it looked like a regular old church. Hmm. I didn't see any ruins at all. So I was like, this is, it's, and it, it's still an active church. But then I started walking around the property and there are indeed ruins on either end of it spectacular ruins. Mm. And so I circled it and um, the ruins that are on either end were the ruins of the Norman and medieval church. Um, And they're really well preserved and labeled and tell a lot of stories about it. At one point there is a, there is a coffin um, that was found in, that was excavated at some point, a really small, weirdly shaped coffin um, and I can't remember what it says, but it's, oh, I can't remember. Shoot. But it is like they put it up on the wall of the ruins for people to see. Wow. It wasn't there originally, but it was really cool looking. I thought you were going to say that you, you took a little cotton swab of the DNA from there to see if it was one of your relatives. <laughs> <laughs> no, this was a, this was a coffin from like the ninth or 10th century. But still. (laughs) Or 7th century. But but still. Yeah. I mean, if you can get DNA from King Tut, you can sure as hell get it from the 10th century. (laughs) Yeah, you can, but you can't. But here's the thing about that is, like, what I have learned uh, in my years of doing this is that I can't, the, the furthest back that I can get confirmed relatives um, is about late 1700s. Okay. And those are people who match me like around 12 Santa Morgans. Mm -hmm. But beyond that, unless there's like a really sticky piece of, of DNA. Yeah. That's a weird way to put it. Um, but it really is only reliable or relatively reliable pun intended. Um, if, uh, a, Back to there. I guess at so that you have point, to kind of rely you, on the paper you could, trail. If you were able to find, yeah, the paper trail, as I was going to say, is yeah. like find the birth and death records and marriage. Right. Yeah. And even then, but even then, we don't know how right. much of that was true and who was so, you know, we're no, not going to find No, but if you can go DNA all the mm-hmm. way back to that, at least you can start there as opposed exactly. to starting now, you know, in 2023. All right. I'm going to read from Wikipedia um, just a little bit about this uh, site. St. John the Baptist Church is the former cathedral of Chester, Cheshire, England during the early Middle Ages. The church was first founded in the late 7th century by the Anglo-Saxons, is outside Chester city walls on a cliff above the north bank of the River Dee. It is now considered the to be the best example of 11th and 12th century church architecture in Cheshire and was once the seat of the Bishop of Lichfield from 1075 to 1095. The church remained Chester's cathedral until 1082 when the see was transferred, S-E-E, I don't know what that means, uh, to Coventry, whatever. With the dissolution of the monasteries in the 16th century, Chester Abbey became Chester Cathedral and St. John the Baptist lost its ecclesiastic importance. The East Wing was partially demolished, and its status was reduced to a parish church. Although repairs were carried out during the reign of Elizabeth I, the church was garrisoned into the English civil, uh, in the English Civil War by the Roundheads. That, that seems insulting. I wonder if the Roundheads are related to the fat face. <laughs> I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> It's all there's it's all coming together. And as far as the C, I think S E E, I think that they refer to the um the Pope as the oh. Holy See. Seriously? Yes. Have you not seen that before? Like you know the no. Holy See. Yes. So how I, do you, a Jew, know that? Oh God, I have so much information up here in <laughs> I this know you do. and I don't I know. know where it comes from. It's a reservoir of generally useless information so I, i'm sure i do remember i have i have very <laughs> vivid memories of being um, at my irish catholic grandmother's oh and that's right you what, are half yes catholic and she yeah. was watching um and waiting for them to come out and name w- what turned out the to pope. be pope john paul 
the yes. second, but at the at time, conclave. Yes. So and yes. like and you know everything was stopped as they were waiting for them to come out of that room to yeah. you know naming the the pope. And so I probably yeah. it probably stems from back then. It probably does. Okay. Isn't it weird that I've never heard that or it never registered with me? Yeah, yeah. And I just seeing it written, I was like, is that a typo? What does that mean? <laughs> um, yeah, I remember. I remember being glued like the, when I first learned about conclave. I was fascinated by it. It's sort of like waiting in high school for them to put up the um, the cast list of the musical. <laughs> if only they did it with different colored smoke. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you're like, I can't believe I'm not playing Jesus in Jesus Christ Superstar. I got the black smoke again. <laughs> chorus again, stuck in the chorus. So... Uh, while the external fabric of the church is largely early English in style due to Victorian restorations, much of the interior consists of Norman material. Again, I didn't get inside of it. But as the interior of the church is now is probably very similar to when my when the Boltons were there. Right. Um, I'm not sure about externally, but uh, I do know that my at least my uh, at least John Bolton was buried there. Um it used to be a graveyard all around there among those ruins, but, uh, and they left the bodies there, but they took away the headstones. And I think Michael Bolton performed there, actually. He did. <laughs> he did. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm trying to think of a Michael Bolton song. Uh, um, how am I supposed to live without you? Or how something? am I supposed to live without a headstone? <laughs> Please cut that. That's terrible. I think it's funny. Right. I'm not cutting no. it. <laughs> oh, thanks. Thank you. So yeah, it so it felt like hollowed ground to me. Um, it was it was the most beautiful. It felt so peaceful. There was a group of teenagers, um, like sitting around smoking in the ruins. That was kind of cute. <laughs> You know what I mean? They were probably up to no good, but I was, uh, I don't know. It just kind of felt like this is their life as a teenager. They're in like thousand, thousand year old ruins just hanging out. They were just smoking. Yeah. yeah. And then the black smoke went up and, <laughs> and the new Pope was named. You're like those weren't teenagers. <laughs> they were Cardinals. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay, I'll finish off this chapter with, so then we went back to our hotel as the sun started to go down. And as we were walking to our hotel, our hotel used to be a mill, as everything used to be a mill uh, in that part of the country. And at the top of the chimney, way up at the mill, uh, my brother noticed a single black crow watching us. Oh, your symbol. Uh Uh-huh. For both of us. Yeah. At different times in our lives. So, you know, we're assuming it was probably our father. That's but, so cool. Um, yeah, and then he followed us to Bristol, which is the next place we went. And uh, I will tell you guys about that next time. Great. Yeah. Well, then, in that case, I am Richard Castle, and you can go to my website, richardcastle.com. I have really been kind of uh, quiet on social media lately, so um, you can go to X, uh, formerly known as Twitter, and find me <laughs> at, at, at Castle Songs or... Uh, on Instagram, but you won't find anything within the last couple of months. So if you're looking for up-to-date information, give it up. You're just going to have to go and ask on our Facebook page for the yes. Cutoff Jeans podcast. So Yes, we do have some new members of the Facebook group because I think they probably heard my warning. Not my warning, but uh, in last week's episode, I explained yes. that there is a page that a lot of people, a lot of people joined the other one, which is not a group. It's just like right. a page. Oh, I'm glad, I'm glad so, you did that then. So we yeah. can let some more people into the group. Yes. Yes. And I am Julie Dixon Jackson. You can find all things Julie Dixon Jackson at cutoffjeans.com, including old episodes. Uh, the, they only leave a hundred or so episodes, um, on the platforms, on podcast platforms. But you can go, you can click through to the actual web page of the archives of the episodes, uh, like from episode one, actually. Wow, great. So, yeah, you can do that. Uh, you can read my blog and uh, all other things, and you can send me a message. And that's it. Julie, what would you tell King Tut if he were here, besides, oh. you know, cool it? Well, I would tell him he probably couldn't find any to fit him properly, but the truth is in his jeans. <laughs> <laughs>